Hello. Welcome to You Asked For It. I'm your host, Belinda Kennedy. And today we have a very special guest, Kyle Rosenberg. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, Kyle, tell us all what you do. Well, uh, <clears throat> in the city arborist in Bath, so that, that entails quite a bit. Obviously, focusing on trees, um, the care and the maintenance and planting new ones. And so it's a lot of fun. Um, we work with the city planning office at times. Uh, if a, a new business is coming to town, uh, part of their planning process is to provide a landscape plan. So generally, the, we have a chance to review that plan to make sure the trees that are being placed there are, are trees we'd like to see as part of our urban forest, making sure that they're not invasive species or if they're not just more than one species in, in the mix. So that, that's kind of neat, being involved with that. And uh, do a little bit of, of grant writing um, for different projects, um, street tree inventory. and. Uh, oh yeah, that's really exciting. When yeah. You showed me the computer program that you have. Yes. Um, you have an inventory of all the trees? All the trees much? that are municipally owned, yes. Yep. And how does that affect the homeowners as far as five feet onto their their lawns. How does that work? Well, the you know the way we determine who owns a tree that may be between a house and the road is using uh, the tax assessor's maps and actually figuring out where the where the homeowner's property line stops and where the city starts. And so, if there's a tree that exists on city property, um, as part of that mapping, then we would uh, part put that into the inventory. We we uh, record its species, its uh, size of the trunk, generally how tall it is. If there's any problems with the tree, like if there's large dead branches in the tree that maybe overhang the sidewalk or the road. Uh, if there's any power lines overhead that may be a problem in the future. And uh, we put all that into a database. We, oh, we also collect its longitude and latitude. And then we put that all into a database with the <coughs> A final goal being <clears throat> a map that we place onto the city website. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, a map we place onto the city website. So maybe folks that are coming to town or people who already live here, if they have a city owned tree in front of their house and they're not sure what it is, they could go to the city website, draw up their address, and find the, the name of the tree and maybe one or two facts about that particular plant. That's great. So we're really looking forward to getting that on, on to the city website probably within the next year or so. And is that something that you uh, figured out how to do, or is it, is well, it a we, program it, we were, that other towns have? Um, a number of towns have that. Um, I'm not sure if any city in the state does right now. Um, there are uh, others, l larger metropolitan areas that do have that, and what we are fortunate enough to have received some grant money from Project Canopy, which is sort of the urban and community forestry uh, division of uh, the Maine Forest Service. And so through this grant, we are working with an engineering firm to generate software that we can take out into the field with a tablet, and we can record all that information with the tablet, bring it back to the, to the office, sync it with the with the office computer and using GIS, we can generate a map of, of, of these trees that, that can be updated regularly, not, all, not only on the office computer, but also on the city website. So as new plants are inventoried and put into the database, then we can actually update the city map as well. So it's kind of neat in that sense. It's like, you know, this, <clears throat> the trees within a municipality are an asset of, this, of that municipality if they're inventoried. So just like a building or a vehicle or a park. Um, so what's those, the value, would you say, of There are, there are different the ways to determine the value of a, of a tree. Um, generally, uh, FEMA, if there's, a, if there's a severe weather event, FEMA will place a value of $400 on any inventory tree, basically the cost of the tree and then the planting of it. Um, but there are other calculators that can uh, better or more accurately determine the value of a tree as far as how well it offsets carbon, its heating and cooling benefits, how much uh, rain water it deflects from the utilities. And so, and all those do have a have a value, a dollar value to the city. 
you know, if the city doesn't have to process X amount of gallons of water because trees and other plants are absorbing it before it enters into the system, then that's a savings to the city as well. Absolutely. So um, having those sort of assets to manage is, is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of different types of jobs that you do because you'll sometimes climb trees, mm -hmm. sometimes um, you're assessing all these trees. Yes. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you, um, well, do you ever rescue cats out of trees? <laughs> Not yet, but I'm sure that that will happen. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I was like, I know fire departments usually get called for that, yeah. but you've got have, those good climbers. That's true. I have rescued a, a, a gasoline uh, remote control airplane out of a, out of a tree once. So that's, that's the closest adventure I've had so far to any sort of rescue operation. Right. But. So when a homeowner has a downed tree in their yard, would they call the electric company? I mean, obviously, if it's on a power line, but how would you inform them to, what to do about a down tree or an invasive tree yeah. or a tree they think that's going to fall? Right. So what would you do? <clears throat> well, um, for folks who live within the city of Bath, we're, we're sort of a resource for them. So if they did have a question, they could contact uh, my office and we could go out and take a look at the tree and assess you know, how, what risk it poses of falling apart, whether it's branches or maybe splitting apart or causing damage to the property. Um, we can tell them the species and if it's an invasive, what steps they could take to maybe take it off the property if that was uh, of interest to them, have it removed. Um, if it's a city-owned tree, then we have a different responsibility than if it was a privately owned tree as far as uh, removing and all of that. Um, but if someone did have a tree on their property that, uh, that they wanted to see removed, then we can make suggestions. And uh, we do keep a list of, of uh, preferred contractors that we can give them as referral and you know, refer each one equally. So we just give them the list and then they can call down through the list and, and make their own decisions from there. Now, what if somebody decides they want to go outside with their chainsaw and just go cut down some trees in their yard? What is there? Are there laws? Um, only if those trees are on the city property. So if their lawn was split in half because of how the right of way was originally drawn and a city tree, even though it's in their lawn, is on city property, then yeah, they could they could have uh, repercussions from that mm -hmm. uh, with a fine and some other things. Right. Um, but if it's on their their own property, then it's sort of free will. They can do do as they wish. Right. Yeah. The website is an amazing plethora of information. You have a really nice website, oh, the Saving Bath yeah. and Forestry. You're working on some projects, um, but one of the more important things I want to talk about before we go off on all these other cool things you do <laughs> is the pests and what's going on with the brown-tailed moth. Well, brown-tail is, <clears throat> I, would, I wouldn't say epidemic levels, but it's, it's very high in the Bath area. And uh, as a city, we're not, we don't really have the resources to go and spray every single tree to manage the caterpillars. So what we've been doing is trying to prune out nests uh, this you know, end of winter, early spring, before they really start to hatch and move, move along the, the branches of the tree. Um, we're trying to, we've done the downtown area and, and uh, library park. And so now we're kind of focusing on some of the cemeteries that are uh, I don't know if you know, but Oak Grove Cemetery in Bath it was originally designed to be a park. So there's a, even to this day, there's a lot of use of that particular cemetery. So we're in there right now trying to prune as many nests out as we can before the, the caterpillars become transitory to the point where it's snipping the nest doesn't really accomplish our goals of management. And how do, would you tell people at home how to manage that, how to take care of it, and to be very careful to handling that if they were going to do it in yep. their own yard. Uh, right now, especially because the caterpillars are, are, are sort of in their nests, but during the, the heat of the day, they're going out and just maybe two or three feet from there and trying to find something to, to eat. And then when it gets, starts to cool down, they all come back to the nest and congregate on it. And in the process of doing that, the nice tight nests that overwintered have sort of loosened up so they're a little bit larger and a little bit more easy to spot 
And so I would suggest if someone sees those nests and they're able to reach them, they can prune them out uh, and then soak them in, in uh, soap and water or burn them um, as a way. But not to touch them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the hairs, the caterpillars at this stage are very small, so that the hairs on their body aren't very toxic, but sometimes the nests will incorporate those hairs and uh, so people can have reactions. So, which is, could be a rash or respiratory issues. Yes, yep. I think that you said to me when we were talking before about the hospital had come up with their own salve. Yeah, Mid Midcoast Hospital had come up with its own, its own product. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, uh, I think it was, must have been eight or 10 years ago, Brown Tail was very heavy in Harpswell and Brunswick. And uh, they just had so many people coming in uh, needing cortisone and all the other uh, anti-inflammatories to try to uh, counter the effects of the hairs. So they were, they finally reverse engineered from the hairs a salve that would uh, really reduce the, the inflammation caused by the, by the hairs. So it's really neat. I, I, I'm assuming they still have that. Um, be but it, interesting to, to find that out and I'm sure they do. I would think so. Yeah. I, to be honest, I just haven't contacted them directly as far as knowing that for sure. Right. Um, oh, the other thing that I read on the website, um, informing people not to bring firewood. I mean, this Maine is vacation season. Yes. And yes. people often camp out. Yep. And one of the warnings and one of the things that it's forbidden is to bring firewood from other states into the state of Maine. Right now, yes. Uh, there's a quarantine uh, for emerald ash borer. Uh, emerald ash borer, as the name denotes, it t tends to uh, focus on ash trees. Uh, and out in Michigan, Ohio, down through to New York State and to, to today in New Hampshire, it's caused a great deal of uh, mortality of ash trees. Uh, you know, literally city blocks that were, you know, grand sort of archways of of ash trees are, have been totally wiped out due to this pest. And so the Maine Forest Service has just put a halt to any sort of firework coming into the state because uh, of the fears of that pest uh, really being able to get a foothold here in Maine because we do have quite a bit of native ash in our forests. Plus our urban forests um, have probably been being planted with ash trees because that's a very hardy plant. And so it was probably the last 20 years it's been a trend to plant ash because it's been so tolerant of, you know, sidewalk situations and all that. So we're really uh, vulnerable to a pest such as emerald ash borer. Yeah. Uh, so I, how are they going to police that? Go to parks and recreations, put signs up or at the toll booths? Yeah, they, they are doing quite a media campaign. And they're hitting all those spots, the campgrounds, mm -hmm. uh, all, the, all the places where people might congregate, you know, p prior to coming into the state or just arriving like at York with the, with the rest areas and all of that, trying to just get the word out. Um, but I, as far as enforcement goes, I'm, I would assume if, if, they were, if someone was seen, then there could be some enforcement. But as far as... Uh, you know, like a stakeout looking yeah, right. for, <laughs> for people or, bringing what firewood. What kind of firewood in. do you have? Yeah. Let me see that firewood. Right, right. <laughs> um, so Bath has 14 champion trees. Yes. What is a champion tree? Well, uh, those, are, those are state champs, uh, and they are trees of a certain uh, genus and species, which are represented as being the accumulating the most points within the the system of tallying points. I know that sounds a little ambiguous, but basically you have a tree that has a certain diameter, a certain average crown width, because you picture the canopy of a tree is a, really a circle. So measuring it from the ground, you try to measure two different ways and sort of take the average. And then the height. And from those measurements, you can you, you generate a point system. And that point system uh, can vary depending on which value the tree has, whether it's its girth or its canopy width. And so 
uh, every city or any, any person in the general public feels they have a champion tree, they can take those measurements, figure out the point value of that particular tree, and then submit it to, to uh, the main forest service where, and Project Canopy sort of oversees all that. And then they sift through all that information and uh, eventually they, they publish a, a book, that, you know, The Big Trees of Maine, which should be coming out soon, actually. Uh, and, so, and that's where those trees are recognized and recorded. And so we're, we're really fortunate to have a number of, of those trees here in Bath because it's, it's kind of neat. It gives people sort of a rallying point, you know, and a little bit of, ba a, little bit of a badge. Yeah. You know, like, oh, yeah, we've got some champion trees number in the city. Number two in the state. Yeah. For, I wonder who's number one. Oh, probably Portland, mm. but I'm not sure. But I, think that, I think it's kind of neat because having some of the species that we have, they it sort of points to the history of Bath as far as, you know, uh, captains going out to sea and bringing something unique back to the town and as a process being planted and then here we are 140 years later whatever yeah. it might be and we have a nice big plant that is unique because of its size and its species and you know, so I think we're really lucky in that sense. Definitely. Um, so when you were a kid, <laughs> <laughs> you, all right, you got into being an arborist, mm -hmm. but you told me you did something when um, you were a kid, and I think that's when your career started. What did you used to do? I used to climb trees a lot. <laughs> yeah, I used to. I had a. My parents had a weeping willow tree in the front yard, and I used to climb it and wait for the bus. And so when I saw the bus come, I'd have to toddle down and try to get ready for it. And yeah, I, that's awesome. Yeah, lots of pictures of being a, in a tree as a kid. So we'll I don't see know. See if we can find one of those and, and have <laughs> put it up for you. Yeah, we could do that. I'm sure. Yeah. So you have a real job, but your job is also dangerous. At times. At times. Yeah, depending on, on you know, sometimes a tree limbs can be over a house or over the roadway with cars, and so there's targets and, and uh, other things that could go wrong in the and process. And the weather. Yeah, and the weather. So you really, and you have had quite an education to become an arborist. Well, yeah, I went to Unity College for urban and community forestry, <laughs> which is sort of a blend of traditional forestry and and arboriculture. Mm -hmm. You know, forestry is where you is kind of like the agricultural end of trees. It's where you're growing trees for a crop, and arboriculture generally is is maintaining individual trees. Uh, for the long term. You're the doctor, the tree doctor. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of neat to have those two philosophies. It kind of, you know, the, the agricultural forestry end of things kind of is a little bit more grounded in practicality and the arboricultural end of it is is the science and sort of the the historical sense of of worth at the same time. So it's kind of neat to, to be able to have been exposed to that, I guess you could say. And dealing with community yes. and how the interaction of how things are changing. Yeah. And does zoning change over the years as far as the development of new projects and things like that? Or Certainly. Yeah. Um, I haven't been directly involved, but, you know, it's like a zoning change. With We had a local employer in town a few years ago who was... Uh, gave some land to the city and it had traditionally been sort of a vacant sort of wasteland and uh, the city was able to turn that into a park and plant some trees there and put some grass there and some benches so folks would have an open space to go uh, and, and recreate. So in that sense the changing of zoning is, can be really beneficial. Mm -hmm. well, fortunately it doesn't really go the other way very often as far as you know taking a park and turning it into a parking lot. So, we're, well, yeah, that's good. Yeah, that, that's that really good. Happen. Um, so, what kind of um, what kinds of transformative projects are going on currently in? Um, in the city? Yeah, or? I was going to, there was one, um, 141 acres. Yes, we have Butler Head, yeah. which is a, a wildlife preserve um, that the city uh, sort of has purchased 
and through the help of Kelt has put a, an easement on it where uh, no uh, development of that land can take place, uh, which is really neat because it, it <clears throat> it's sort of a point and it has old trees and an active sugar bush, um, but it also has trails that go along Mary Meeting Bay. Uh, so someone who's interested in, in being uh, on a day hike and maybe a picnic, there's there's all these different little micro environments that they can visit all on on one property. So it's it's really a, a really a neat place. And uh, as time goes on, it's a it's a piece of land that uh, through the forestry committee and through the schools we can use as an educational uh, uh, outreach to the to students, which is which is really neat because uh, if you can get teaching biology and and plant related subjects in, in a classroom you know there might be some attention there but if you get kids out into the woods where they can play and poke and and see things and learn things um, even something as simple as taking a yellow birch twig and snapping it and smelling the minty smell just getting them interacting with nature helps them learn about it in a in a whole different way which I think is really really neat and can be a great benefit from that property in the long run. I think it's so interesting that a lot of times people don't think about the trees that are out there and that they're alive, they're living things that yes. need attention, that need care, yeah. and that there's somebody like you and the town that takes care of that. And so to build that awareness, uh, I think is really important that they just don't take care of themselves. Right, right. And I think maybe living in Maine, folks take that for granted because we are a very wooded state, um, where if you go into southern New England and into more urban areas, I think that awareness might be more acute. Right. And so being able to take kids out into a, an, even into the woods situation where they might take it for granted, um, being able to go there and be sort of their tour guide through it and actually give them some knowledge about it, I think that knowledge places a value on that to them that they may not have had prior. Right. So it's, it can be really fun. Yeah. Um. How do you determine how many plants and trees that you plant on an annual basis? Well, uh, as part of the inventory that we talked about earlier, we do, if we're going down, let's say, uh, one road and we're tallying the different trees, if there's an open space that's within the city right-of-way, then we make a note of that as well. So within our database, we can actually query and find those locations where a tree can be planted. Uh, so that's that's our primary way, but we also uh, have a lot of input from from different groups within the city, and even homeowners that call and say, you know, I have an open lawn, it's on private land, but would the city be willing to give me a tree because you know, there's no trees on my side of the road or you know whatever sort of scenario it is. So we we have inputs from from the public as well as our own management strategies to try to build the urban forests and. Uh, it's really exciting to work with someone who from from their own, in front of their own yard, yes. uh, whether it's private or the city, because uh, I think people there's like a a sense of place that people can have once they've planted a tree and they've watched it for a few seasons. Mm -hmm. It's like anything goes on near that tree, and they're they're walking out to see what's going on. And right. sometimes it's it's a uh, it's really comical to see someone just sort of take that ownership and mm -hmm. march right out to see what's going on. Yeah. But in a good way. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, what types of ways can people volunteer? How do they find out about projects that you're doing? And if they wanted to volunteer or be a part mm -hmm. of some of the things that you do, um, of course, go to the website. But what yeah. other Well, we're ways? on Facebook. Okay. Um, uh, the forestry division of Bath is on Facebook, so I update that regularly. Um, the best place to plug in, as it were, would be through the Bath Community Forestry Committee. Uh, it's a volunteer group that's very active uh, between plantings and the, the city nursery and Butler Head, um, Arbor Day celebrations. The, it's a very active group, and that's a, a great place to kind of jump in um, 
you can do as much or as little as you want, but just being plugged into that committee really uh, keeps people uh, on the pulse of, as it were, of what's going on tree related. Right. Um, and that's, that's probably the best way to, for anyone cool. to, to get what on board. What about good bugs? How do we promote good bugs, butterflies, birds? What can people yeah. do to... Well, um, you know, with, with like pollinators, uh, having flower gardens. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you think of something that comes to mind, be like the monarch butterfly. You know, just allowing the little milkweeds to grow up, even if they're they may take away from the overall landscape. They're sort of temporary in the landscape and it gives a spot for the the monarchs to come in and lay their eggs, a place for the caterpillars to eat and then eventually pupate. And it's kind of, and if there are kids at home, it's a really simple science project to, to watch the pupa eventually open and become the, the monarch that's going to eventually fly back down to Mexico. Right. So, uh, but I think having those having those uh, gardens around the house are really important to pollinators and to birds. Um, you know, hummingbirds are attracted to certain uh, plants, and other birds eat insects. And so, if insects are coming to to a flowering plant for one reason or another, then the birds have a food source, and you know, it really ties them together well. Nice. Yeah. I I did hear about people setting dragonflies yeah. out. To eat mosquitoes. To eat and mosquitoes, and, and we have quite the issue with black flies. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Black flies are good in a sense, though, because they're an indicator of, of fairly clean water. Mm -hmm. uh, unlike a mosquito, a, a black fly needs clean running water to be able to, to go complete its life cycle. Where, uh, you know, a mosquito, you could put kerosene in, in water and put it outside, and eventually there'd be larvae coming out of it. Wow. There's just a difference in and their tolerances as to where they can complete their life cycle. So. What other types of bugs and rodents and things should we be looking for that, and if we see them, do we call you and, and maybe we'll show some pictures? Well, um, hmm. What was that, the hornet that's like, the, it's got blue on it, the blue hornet or something? Blue hornet. I don't know, I thought that the, <laughs> well, the, will, the Asian longhorn beetle Yes, uh, okay, has blue well, feet when it's alive. Maybe it, that's yeah. probably it. And that's a, a big wood boring beetle, which is also an invasive. Um, unlike the emerald ash borer, the Asian longhorn beetle isn't as migratory. It's a big, lazy beetle. It will stay on the same tree year after year. Um, but if they do have an opportunity to, to get into a, an area, they will be they will make a problem with the amount of population that builds. So, so what are some non-pesticide ways of controlling some of these things we've talked about, hmm. like um, the brown-tailed moth and the different yep. types well, of sprays, a homeopathic yep. or whatever? So with the brown-tailed moth, the, there aren't many sprays that are labeled that are uh, truly non-chemical. There are uh, organically approved uh, products that can be applied, but they're still a still a pesticide. They just may not have one ingredient or another off off of the more uh, powerful pesticides that sort of give them a chance to be labeled as something different. Uh, I, I would caution any homeowner who's applying pesticides to follow the label to make sure that they're doing it properly, wearing the proper gear and uh, safety safety gear, and if if they have to get to a point where they're sort of tiptoeing on a ladder to get to the top of the tree, it might be a time to consider hiring a professional, who, uh, especially with brown tail, who deals with something like that, who can has the proper equipment and can do it safely. Absolutely. Awesome. Let's see, anything else that we wanted to talk about? <laughs> uh, we've, uh, there's so many things that you do and that affects our air and our um, environment, the parks, and mm. it, I mean, it's just... Yeah, Bath is really unique because it has so many large plants in it that uh, it's, it's sort of a, a nod to the, to the history of, this, of the city. You have all these old, unique buildings that wouldn't have the same appeal if it wasn't for the old trees and shrubs that were around them. They kind of, they kind of, uh, 
complement each other mm -hmm. in that sense. Absolutely. Uh, they, I, one without the other uh, isn't, isn't the same as having them both. Right. And so in Bath, where we do have that, that blend of old, old homes, old neat homes and uh, large plants, I think we're, we're really lucky in that sense. If anybody would like to learn more about what's going on in the city of Bath, and um, to look for more information, Kyle, where would they go for that? Well, they can uh, follow, follow us on Facebook at uh, Forestry Division of Bath. Uh, we're on the web at the city website underneath the Parks and Rec. We have our own uh, link under there, under Forestry. Um, and those are probably the two best ways to, get a, to keep up with what we're doing. Excellent. All right, well, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next time.